Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 88th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Nancy Blakey. Nancy is the founder of Sales Pro Insider, a sales training platform for financial advisors that teaches how to better turn prospects into actual clients. What's unique about Nancy, though, is her somewhat non-traditional sales training approach, which isn't about pushing features and benefits and going for the hard close, but simply about having a structure to the conversation that occurs in an approach talk with a prospect to ultimately help them make a decision or take an action at the end. Because the reality is, even if you're in the business to get paid for your advice and not to sell your company's products, you still have to sell someone on the reason why they should hire you and pay your fee in the first place. In this episode, we talk in depth about Nancy's with it structure to the sales conversation, which is both focusing on the what's in it for them of the with it acronym, but also a five-step conversation process of wait and prepare, initiate, investigate, facilitate, then consolidate. The importance of asking more questions to really understand a prospect's context so that you can refine and right-size the information that you give them. And the dangers of giving prospects more information than they actually need in a manner that can just put them into analysis paralysis instead of helping to motivate them to take an action or make a decision. We also talk about the actual key questions to ask a prospect throughout the meeting process. Process. From setting an agenda with them in advance of every meeting to ensure you're really discussing what they want to discuss, asking what it is that brought them to the meeting to begin understanding what their real problems, opportunities, wants, and needs are, asking prospects for feedback about how your services and proposals sound to them as you describe it to them, and being certain at the end of a meeting to actually ask for their business and making it crystal clear what the next step would be in order for them to proceed. And be certain to listen to the end where Nancy explains why the biggest and most common problem that financial advisors make in trying to get new clients is our tendency to try to convince clients that they need a financial plan in the first place. Instead of listening to what they actually want and need and relating the benefits of financial planning to their problems and concerns. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Nancy Blake. Welcome, Nancy Blakey, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. I'm really excited to be here with you, Michael. I'm I'm looking forward to this discussion today because we are going to talk about a taboo topic, which is you know always fun in the podcasting room to talk about things that no one else talks about. We're we're going to talk about the bad word sales, and sales and selling to me like I I have a a very visceral experience with this myself. Like as, as many of our listeners know, I, I started in the industry straight out of college as a life insurance agent in a sales job. I was, I was a terrible salesperson, or I guess to be fair, I was, I was a mediocre salesperson and a terrible prospector. So I couldn't, I couldn't even find anybody to get in front of to be a mediocre salesperson and, and spent most of the first 10 years of my career doing whatever I could to find a job that would not require me to sell. I didn't mind being with clients and working with clients as long as I didn't have to sell them and get them on board. And yeah, I find that attitude has become prevailing in a lot of the industry, particularly for people that are coming in today. Like we're not, we're not coming in to be financial salespeople. We're coming in to be financial advisors and help people. And it took me a long time to have the revelation that, you know, even if you don't want to sell products and you just want to give advice and get paid for advice, you still have to sell. You're just selling yourself and your expertise. Like you, you, you still have to get them to say yes to pay you. It's not actually that different from a product. You're just selling something a little more personal because you're selling yourself, which means when they say no, it feels more personal. And in some ways, it's actually harder to sell. And so I'm excited today just to have this conversation of tackling sales as an advisor head on. You know, I'm really excited to talk about this topic too, Michael, because I was a reluctant salesperson, just like you described. And when I was graduating with my bachelor's degree, I was really on high alert that I was not going to go to any job that 
looked like it could be a sales job. And in, in one of the interviews, I had to, I didn't know what the job was for. It was very mysterious how they positioned it. And I got a phone call right away from the manager who asked me to come to his office in downtown Kenosha, Wisconsin. And I, I went there and the first thing you had to do was complete what I realized later was like a sales assessment. And, and many of the questions were about selling to friends and family and how many family members do you have? And are you comfortable talking to them about money? And of course, I'm like, uh, no, no, no. And so when I, when I went into his office and he was able, I think, to quickly look at it and determine not a chance was I going to be good in sales selling his, because tur- it turned out to be life insurance products. I was out of that interview in about four and a half minutes, I think. <laughs> I, I I went through the the same thing, getting drawn in. Like one of the one of the places I applied for quote financial advisor job because I, I didn't understand at the time it was a life insurance sales job. Like it was with with one of the major life insurance firms, and they they gave me their whole questionnaire that, in retrospect, was basically trying to suss out my sales skills and my and my comfort to to go through their sales training and and I and I flunked their quiz because they 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 basically said something like they found a nice way to say it but it was essentially you're too analytical for us to train you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you're not welcome here which at the time I didn't take well cuz you know I was all all excited to be graduating from college and getting a job and didn't like failing anything in retrospect like boy they were really right <laughs> I, I would i would not have been good in that in that sales training cuz it was what i now know is a a very product oriented company they 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 did their product sales training and then they sent you out there to sell their product and i would have analyzed the heck out of the product and realized it wasn't actually that good of a product and that would not have gone well so to their credit their sales assessment tools were very accurate but like the whole job was sales at the time. I, again, like I think it, it, I think it soured a lot of people to the industry. You know, as 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 it did you in in running far and quickly from that interview, and and as it did for me that I was, I guess, I, I was stubborn enough or interested enough to stay in the industry, but spent a decade trying to make sure I didn't have to be in jobs that would do that, mm-hmm. o- only to discover this whole other realm. After the first decade or so of my career, which is, you know, when when you really are confident and proud of like your knowledge and your abilities and your skill set to help people, you kind of want to help them. Like it it doesn't feel like selling in the same way. Yes, eventually I need to understand someone's problems and convince them that I can help them and get them to sign a piece of paper to engage me. So like it is in the literal sense a sales process, but for me now, it, it, it's much more of I've got this stuff that I do that I know is valuable. Like, why would I not want to tell everybody that I meet about it? Like, do it nicely, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm proud I can help people. I want to tell them about it. Like, it's, it's, it's such a different feeling and experience around sales than like anything I knew or thought of or even was trained in early on, which was still very like, sell the product features and benefits, features and benefits. Mm -hmm. Instead of just having a conversation. And when we look at sales, I mean, and and it's funny because I'm like a reformed smoker. You know, people that used to smoke and don't are the worst. And me being a, a reluctant salesperson for eight, nine years, then discovering that there is an ethical and comfortable approach to selling that really works and like you said, if I really believe that what I'm offering is a value, helping somebody solve a problem, do something better, satisfy a want or a need, then I need to help them make that decision that's going to allow them to get that. And, and if I'm uncomfortable with selling, I'm not going to get to that part where I really do get to help. And I think what's fascinating in the financial services world is that the sales process can also be helpful and valuable to them as well. Because how often are you working with people, especially if they're a couple, where one of them is much more interested in doing something and you've got that reluctant staller who needs 
to have help and that couple or family isn't going to get what they need unless you are a guide to help them make a decision. And that's what selling is, is helping people through your conversations make a decision or take an action that gets them closer to something they want or need. You have such a powerful point there in, in, in framing sales that way. It, it was, it truly felt for me like one, one of those proverbial light bulb above head moments, like the, the eureka moments when that hit me for the first time. And it was, it was a book I read a number of years ago by Bev Flaxington called Pocket Guide to Sales for Financial Advisors and just, you know, lots of basic sales skills and sales techniques. And, and one of the things that, just really struck me and hit home in the book was this idea of framing sales as look, you know, you, you, you have a valuable thing. You shouldn't feel bad about putting it out there to help people with it. If you feel bad about it, like you need to find a different company you can work for where you're not ashamed of what you have to sell. So once you have a thing, you're actually proud to give or do or sell or deliver or, or help clients with, even if you've got a wonderful thing and even if they need it, not everybody realizes that they they should do something with this now, right? Like they're being knuckleheads or they just don't understand the benefit of the value of what you do, or they don't fully understand the problems they've got right now and why they need to change or, you know, all, all those different reasons why even good, smart, well-intentioned people don't always see the value of something in front of them. And that the point of selling is not to drag some unwilling person who doesn't want to buy your stuff to buy your stuff. The point is to figure out who actually needs what you have, who just might not realize it or isn't at the point to make the decision and take the action yet, and help them <laughs> to make the decision and take the action. And it was very transformative for me to, to, to think about it differently that way. That like I'm, I'm not trying to convince people who don't want to buy my stuff to buy my stuff. I'm trying to help the people who should buy my stuff to get it easier and realize that they need it and how much it will actually help them. To make a confident decision to get that value, that's what we're helping them do. So, you know, the other part is when I think about financial advisors and many of the ones I work with, it's like you're putting all this effort into more designations, into all of this passive marketing stuff, hoping that it's all going to happen you're going to be out of business soon if you don't get people paying you for, for what you can do. And they start getting on the trap of doing a lot of pro bono stuff, which I, I, I think that's good. But if you're spending more time doing pro bono work with clients that aren't your ideal for later, because clients who are your ideal can connect you to more clients that are your ideal, you're not going to succeed and be able to have the revenue that you need to support yourself, your family, your business. And, and so tackling this inner belief around what selling is, and it's not what I went to school for. It's not why I went into financial planning. My parents would be embarrassed if I was a salesperson. We need to get over that because it's what's getting in the way of helping more people. Yeah. And, and at the end of the day, I mean, at, at an even more basic level, particularly when we're in the, in the advice business, like, Never mind just the, the quote, the sale of, hey, you got to sign this engagement letter to say that you'll hire me and pay me some dollars. Like, if you're going to give the client advice and just have them actually follow the advice and implement the advice, mm -hmm. you still have to sell the advice. Like, we don't tend to think of it in a sales context, but, you know, all the things you would do to persuade a client to actually implement what you're recommending that they implement is still a persuasive sales technique. It's still a sale. So you know, even if you don't want to focus on the selling aspect of trying to get them to hire you, there's still a selling aspect of just what you're doing in the literal action of giving advice and trying to get clients to, to take the advice. Daniel Pink had a, a book a couple of years ago called To Sell as Human that just was entirely that theme of like, Everything that anybody does in any kind of professional services realm and really most of what we do in any job has a massive component of sales, whether you're you know, convincing the clients, convincing your employees, convincing your peers, convincing your boss, like whatever it is. It's just the essence of all of it is 
using your skills to persuade someone to make a decision or take an action. And obviously you can do that in good ways and bad ways. So we're going to talk about the good ways here and not all the bad ways. You know, use, use the force for good and not for evil. Yeah. Daniel Pink's book came out about weeks, I think, before mine did. And, you know, so I, I devoured his book and I'm like, right on, Daniel, you know, like, right on. <laughs> I totally, you know, sync with that everyone is selling. And, and I think you just gave that clarification I mentioned earlier that it's not just about getting by decisions. It's about getting people's commitment. And when I hear advisors talk about their, their, they've got people that have signed agreement and then they go dark and don't answer anything for months and months. Some of them have even made their first payment or, you know, set up the, the payment service and then just go dark and don't respond to anything and don't take action to get in the, the documents and information they need to so the work can really begin. That's someone who made a decision but isn't committed to the actions, which then is another conversation to figure out what's what's in the way. Why, what's, what's, what's those barriers that are fears usually keeping them from doing something? And so you did a book around this theme. You have a training program around this theme, which is why I wanted to have you here on the podcast to to, to talk about it. So so tell us a little bit about like the the trainings and what you do in helping you know folks like me, particularly me then, although I'm sure I could still use the the help now of getting better at at sales and sales conversations. Well, it is. It's about the conversation. And so our training and my book is called Conversations That Sell. And it's it's about how we can use our conversation as the most valuable tool we have in selling. And that means that's us being able to engage in an information exchange. That's what a conversation is like we're doing that that has a purpose and is moving somewhere. And it's a conversation is productive when there is a desired outcome. And it's not just our outcome, it's a joint collaborative outcome. And so our approach goes beyond, we talk about consultative selling. Everyone's heard that over the years. And in today's world, people are so much better educated or they have access to so much more information for anything they want to do. And that it's slowed down people's decision making as far as time. And it's also made people second guess whether it's the right decision. They get stuck in analysis because if I do this, if I if I decide to work with Michael, well, wait, there's so you know, there's these other 12 people that I I've liked their blogs or I've liked this. And have I really vetted them out? And and they they get paralyzed then to do anything. Yeah, that's the you know, the the infamous paradox of choice. Like we we say we want more choices, and then we get more choices, and then we feel like we have to analyze and research them all, and then we're so afraid we're going to make the wrong choice that we don't actually make a choice specifically because we had so many of them that it bogged us down. And and right, so that going back to that value that we bring along the selling process, it's helping people sort through the information they already have. And that we might be sharing with them to focus on what's most important and cut out the other clutter so that they can confidently make that decision or take an action. So, you know, the approach is collaborative, that we're doing this with somebody and that we're using our conversation where we're asking the questions that let us know what do they already know? Because when you're especially selling financial services, you do know more than probably the people you're talking to in most aspects of finance. But you don't know what they know unless you give them a chance to tell you. So you can easily oversell or do, and you know, Alan Moore and I debate about the pitch. You know, you got to pitch. Well, people don't like to be pitched at. And they don't, and we don't like to be pitched at because we inevitably at some point in the pitch get stuck in the like, you're telling me things I already, I already know. This is getting boring. Now it's really annoying because you're just blathering on more about things that I already know. And I can't even get a word in Edwise to tell you that I already know this stuff, which is making the whole conversation less relevant for me. So now I'm tuning it out and thinking about the baseball game I'm going to tomorrow. And and now you've completely lost me and I'm not listening to anything that you're saying anymore about your sales pitch. I'm just trying to get out of here. That's what I'm like, right? Let me out. What's Where's my exit? Where's my escape hatch? Let me out of here. And right, I think you hit it on that. It's about it's not relevant. 
And we can be irrelevant so easily if we don't first seek to understand information about them. And it's funny, even in this last month or so, some of the advisors I've been talking with will talk about how their first meeting is them telling the prospect their process. And I'll say, did they give you permission for that? You know, did you earn the right for their time and attention to care about what your process is? And as you're explaining your process, are you focused on the pieces that are going to be important to them? So if you're, you know, talking in your process is heavy, helping them plan for retirement, but the people in front of you really have debt concerns, you're, you're not talking their language. You're not talking what's relevant and they're going to immediately not start seeing value. And then when you present your holistic approach for those that present that, they're going to start saying, well, I don't need that part and that part and that part. Therefore, your fees are too much. So let's take out some of those things and reduce the fees and then maybe I can work with you. So we set it up to be this, this disconnect. That's a really interesting point about how I think a lot of us struggle with selling like comprehensive planning and the value of comprehensive planning that we talk about, like what we're going to do is holistic and we're going to cover everything together. And then clients come back with, well, I don't actually need this part and that part. So can I have you know, 40% off my fee since I don't want 40% of the stuff that you just listed? And that we basically set ourselves up for it by overselling holistic when, you know, to be fair, I mean, I've joked about this on, on some of our other podcasts as well. You know, we, we like to sell holistic financial planning. I've never actually met a single person who woke up in a cold sweat at two o'clock in the morning saying like, I've got to get a holistic financial plan. <laughs> like when I, when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to take care of this. Like, we, like, I mean, you might wake up in the middle of the night, like, I'm freaked out because my spouse is sick and I don't know what the medical bills are going to do with us. I'm, I'm freaked out because I just realized my kid's going off to college in 18 months and I don't know if we're going to be able to afford this or you know, I'm I'm thinking about retiring soon. I just want to know if I can afford that. Like there are absolutely money issues that keep us up at night that wake us up, that drive us to action that say like, I got to get some help for this. And I might not even realize I need more help than this, than just this. So you can, you can get me there to the broader thing, but no one wakes up in the middle of the night that says like, oh my God, I have to get a comprehensive financial plan. I'm going to find me one of those this, when I get up in the morning. And so if that's what we're selling, even if it's valuable and even if it's relevant, like we're, we're, we're failing that selling framing that you had said, which is we're not offering the thing that's either relevant to them or framed in a way that's relevant for them. So we're not doing much to help them make a decision or take an action. I, ironically, I think we actually we're making it complex, and I think that's the that's you know this collaborative approach is about making it easy for them along the whole path. Make it easy for them to be able to share information that lets us know. Let, let I would say it lets us uncover their problems, opportunities, wants, and needs around finances, but also helps them discover some clarity about their own situation. And whenever you're dealing with more than one person, if you're you know dealing with family situations or couples, they're not always going to be on the same page. So you start adding value and clarity by the questions that you're asking and what you're getting them to talk about. And then that is where you can, when you learn that information, is then when you can position, it doesn't mean you do your service different, but what's going to help them make a decision is maybe three or four of the points, not the 16-point process that you take. Or my, my favorite is when people, well, I, you know, I let them know that we're having four meetings a year and blah, 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 you know, about their fees. And I'm like, do they care that they're having four meetings a year? They might be thinking, gosh, that's a lot of time I'm going to have to spend with you. And the number of meetings a year is not what's valuable. It's what's happening during that meeting and before and after that that has value to it, not the number of meetings. So that's like one example. If we, we focus on a specific nuance that we think is what justifies our fees, it probably doesn't. 
because it, it's not focused on the, the connection of what's in it for them, what's the real value there. It's, it's a list of those features that can bog down. And now I can start comparing, well, you have four meetings. If I go with so-and-so, you know, I have unlimited this and I have the, they start comparing the wrong things. Well, and you, and you have a good point that just at the most basic level, like I, I'm, I've been guilty of this in, in client approaches as well of, you know, talking about things like, you know, we're a, you know, we're a really deep service firm and, and we, you know, we meet with our top clients like you on a quarterly basis. And I, I still remember I had one of those that came up a number of years ago now, and, and we're here in the, the DC metro area. So our, our traffic is horrible. You know, we're usually one of the top three worst traffic cities every year behind maybe LA and Atlanta. And, you know, we were talking to the client about, you know, it was going to be a fairly affluent client. So like, here's our high touch service, the great things that we do at the firm. And, you know, we, you would be a client that we would meet with four times a year. And like, I could, I could see him like reacting negatively to that. And fortunately managed to have the presence of mind of just say like, you know, you, you seem negative about four meetings a year. I'm like, why, why are you unhappy? And and he said, like, it took 40 minutes to get here in traffic. The thought of doing that four times a year sounds horrible. And like, we're selling the high touch service of you get to meet with us four times a year. And he's hearing, I have to sit in DC traffic four <laughs> times a year way to come work with you. And like, we were getting further from working with him. What he actually really loved was quarterly phone calls where he didn't have to get in the car and come see us. Right. So we took the one thing that we thought was one of our like best selling points of the extra, you know, the extra value we add for our A clients is that we meet with you four times a year instead of two times a year. And and it was a negative. Negative, form. yeah. <laughs> and I like the only reason we caught it was like he's just He's one of those people that just like wears his emotions on his sleeve and is very visual and everything that he does. Like he couldn't hide how badly he felt about or how negatively he took the four meetings a year. So the only that was the only reason we caught like we we certainly had never to that point had had ever said like we normally meet with our clients like you four times a year. How does that sound? we would just talk about as like, well, this is clearly an awesome feature. We're high touch. We meet with you more often. And it was only literally seeing someone react that negatively to it to ever realize like, oh, this thing we sell is one of our major features, like not at all relevant for some of our clients. In fact, it's a negative for some of them. And we never, we had never asked them like, how often would you like to meet for this to be a useful advisor relationship? What a different question, right? Then, then giving them the pitch of your features that you said the words, what we think is important. And so in holistic planning, or even if you're selling financial products, there's a lot of different features that come along with what you're providing. And we can overcomplicate that because most people, 80% of that will not matter to them making a decision. So we can easily oversell make it complex, and stall them from making a decision. So this whole make it easy, make it easy. We have to make it easy for them to share the information that's going to be valuable. We have to make it easy for them to learn from us what we can offer that's important to them. And we have to make it easy for them to talk about what is from what we've described, what is valuable, what are they most excited about, what are their concerns. So we call it the four points in, in the investigation. When we have to learn information, we have to find about what is going on with them today. And, and today includes their background of, you know, what's their experiences? What have they done? We also have to find about, you know, what's that future state, the tomorrow. So today, tomorrow, when we're looking to learn information, if we can get what we call the whole story before we start launching into the specifics of what they're going to get, we then can very much connect exactly what's going to be important for them in making the decision. And that really, that's where the expertise of knowing your world 
helps because you got to quickly be able to, I call it right sizing. I got to, I got to be able to adjust the amount of information, the type of information and very specifically the data points that this prospect needs to hear that's going to help them see the value and not overcomplicate it with things that are going to come along and be maybe pleasant surprises later, but aren't necessary for them to make that decision. It's an interesting point of like just the whole idea of right sizing the information you're giving prospects. Like what data points do they actually care about that will drive their decision and and eliminate the the rest? Or I guess, you know, I'm I'm compulsively transparent. It's like maybe I'll give it to them in a supplement or a takeaway or something. They can look at it later if they want. I don't want to exactly. I don't want to hide all the other stuff that we're really proud that we do. But like you 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 don't have to beat them over the head with you know, features and benefits and stuff that you do that they just don't actually care about anyways. Mm-hmm. Knowledge experts. That's, you know, what I call the different professional services, right? Where you're an expert in knowledge on something. And so we, we want to educate and tell, and we can oversell so easily. And again, confuse and confusion in a prospect means no decision. It's got to be easy. So, so you talked about this framing of like four points to get up to speed on a client's story. Right. So, okay. So let's, let's start at the beginning of a conversation. Okay. Cause that's what we do is we, we conversations that sell the book and our training really helps people put together what a complete conversation and sales process needs to be. And, and there's adjustments based on the people and situation and all that, but you know, conversations are always going to be more productive if you've prepared. So we work off of this acronym, what's in it for them, and then we call it the WIF it. So what's in it for them? If if everything any of us do is always focused on what's in it for them, for whoever that other party is, it could be an existing client that you're trying to help make commitments and follow through on actions or prospects. But if we frame everything that we explain connected to what's in it for them, it's, it's all going to be easier. So we need to prepare for that. We need to be ready for who are we meeting with. We have to stop our distractions. We have to not be multitasking. And, and I would say there's two levels of preparation. There's the preparation you can do in advance, which is on, you can do it on paper or on screen where you, you map out what's the objective. How am I starting a conversation? What's the information that I need to learn? about the problems, opportunities, wants, and needs? What's the information I need to know that that's going to help me then be able to make that recommendation? What, so what are the questions I need to ask? You know, What's the possible recommendations I might be making? And if I'm going to recommend our holistic service or I'm going to recommend this, what's the value connection? What are the objections or fears that might come up? And then how am I going to effectively work through that? So I can map out the conversation. And I can do that days in advance or a week in advance for upcoming meetings. And then there's the powerful pause right before engagement. Whether you're picking up a phone, you're walking into a place where they're going to be, or they're entering your domain. And it can be 15 seconds or it could be five minutes, but it's you refocusing on what's coming and these people and eliminating your other preoccupation. Because if you engage preoccupied, you can't help them break their preoccupation when the exchange starts. Because let's just say people, like you said, coming into your DC office, they have just been through who knows what to get there, right? (laughs) It takes like 10 minutes just to work off the latent road rage by the time you go through our traffic. Well, and, and actually there's research that the best predictor of someone's behavior in the in the 20 minutes, in the next 20 minutes, is what has happened to them in the last 20 minutes. Uh-huh. It's, it's, the recency, it's the recency impact. So you can expect that when you are initiating contact with a person, scheduled or not, you don't know what's going on because you don't know what's just happened in the last 20 minutes to them. Interesting. So should I ask that? Like, well, I guess that's part of the, you know. That's part of the initiation. In, is, like, is, how, how, to, how is your drive coming in the office? So at least if they say, oh my God, it was horrible. I, I know we need to just drag this out a little bit because they're not going to be in a good mental state for a few minutes here. Exactly. And, you know, in those, you know, people that have 
a receptionist or someone that greets people, it's training them to, to, to help break that and help the person kind of get into the present. You know, that's what you're trying to do. So, so if you're preoccupied, it's hard for you to be present and be paying attention to what they need at that time to make those adjustments. Or someone, it took them longer to get there. We could use that example. It took them longer to get to your office and they had a finite amount of time with you. Now they're pressed for time because they have to get to something, get kids somewhere, whatever their commitment is. And they're also worried about their departure and what that's going to look like. So now they're preoccupied with, oh man, this was scheduled for 90 minutes we now have 75. If I sit around and chit chat too much, I'm not going to be able to get to the things that are important to me. And, you know, and they want to speed things up. And if we miss that and not be able to help them settle in and gain agreement on the objective and confirm the amount of time we have so that we can get them to be in this open information exchange, we're fighting a losing battle in that, you know, in that first 20, 30 minutes. So, so that preparation has to be so important that again, beforehand on paper is sketching out everything, but that those, that mental pause to get your head ready to help them once the engagement starts. So that's, so that's where it starts. And then when we start a conversation, so preparation, it's funny, I just was working with a group this week and no one will disagree that preparation is important, but they have all kinds of reasons why they can't. Yeah, (laughs) all kinds of reasons or excuses. And so, you know, just even that practicality of how do we set up that discipline? Right. Like just setting buffers between your meetings. Don't, if you've got a 3.30 meeting, don't schedule something else right up until 3.30 or 3.20 even, because you're not going to have enough time to come out and get in the right mental state. You know, I, I, I got to the point quickly where I just started buffering 30 minutes between any, any time I was doing multiple client or consulting meetings is it just took, it took 10 minutes to decompress from the last meeting and, you know, jot my notes or whatever it was. It took 10 minutes just to you know, grab a drink or walk to the water cooler or whatever. And, and then, and then 10 minutes to sit down and, and just get refocused on like, okay, the next meeting coming up is this client and here's what we got to talk about. And okay, here's what I have on the agenda. And, and just like, do I have everything get, I need? Getting my, right? <laughs> getting my head back into the game for the meeting that was coming up. Mm-hmm. And that is absolutely a best practice is in, in scheduling your buffer, your, your post meeting time, your pre meeting time. One of our clients in, in Toronto he really took issue with that, 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 that just wasn't necessary. Their meetings are back to back, you know, other people get things together, et cetera. And, and, but he was, well, he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to test like how important this is. And he came back after a few weeks in the, because a week of uh, course is 10 weeks long. And he said, it's a game changer. That was what he said. It's a game changer. <laughs> I'm like, is it, it's a simple, but that's one of like those simple practices that, we get in our our own way. But the other thing is that when we're looking at meetings, this is a big thing I see people do. Our our first meeting is this amount of time. Like they've determined it's this amount of time. Well, for the situation, we first need to look at what is the agenda? What is the objective? And what is this person's tolerance? And based on that, how long does this meeting need to be? So another client of ours, they had standard 60-minute meetings. And so we challenged them to, instead of always scheduling 60 minutes, to look at what did the agenda dictate as far as the amount of time. And so many more meetings are being done virtually. So you don't need, maybe you needed 60 minutes or 90 minutes when they came in because there was the getting the coffee. There was, you know, all these other things that don't happen virtually. So they can be more time compact. Anyway, they they started making adjustments and they found that they could do 80% of their meetings in 45 minutes instead of 60. Look at that efficiency that was gained by thinking about that. Yeah, I know when we when we started doing more virtual meetings with clients using a video chat or a go-to meeting uh, firm and as we started doing more of that with clients, we had a ton of meetings that started falling from, you know, hour long meetings, which is our standard on the schedule as well. You know, 
an, an hour if it's a short meeting, an hour and a half or two hours if there's stuff and it's a long meeting. But like we never schedule anything less than an hour. And part of that was just again, like traffic is so bad here, like it's going to be 30 plus minutes each way in traffic to get to our office even if they only live 8 or 12 miles away. So, like if it's if it's a 1 hour round trip drive to come in and back, you can't have a less than one hour meeting. Like oh, it just, yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't work, right? At some point, you can't, you can't convince clients to like, hey, you know, spend an, spend an hour round trip in the car to come in for this 27 minute meeting. <laughs> like, you know, th- if you do that, it's the last time they're coming in for a meeting because they're going to say that was a, that was a waste of my time. It was, you know, an hour and a half out of my day for 27 minutes in your office. But when we schedule video meetings and virtual meetings, the meeting just tends to run its natural course, right? Like, as you said, there's a little bit less of the chit chat and stuff, right? Cause I don't, I don't need to spend as long time, as much time just you know, warming them up while they dial down the road rage. And I'm making DC sound horrible. It doesn't take them as long to, to kind of wind down their trip in and get going into where we are. We can talk about the stuff that we need to talk about. And then when the meeting's done, it's it's done, right? Like even even for a client that came in for an hour meeting, you know, there's always the infamous saying like meetings tend to expand to fill their allotted time. Like, you know, hour meetings pretty much always ran an hour, give or take a little. But if there was really only twenty or thirty minutes of stuff to talk about, and we did it as a video meeting, no one ever complains when a video meeting ends early. <laughs> Spontaneous ends early. Right? Like, no one complains when a conference call ends early. No one complains when a when a meeting ends early, unless you drove to that meeting and invest a lot of time in that meeting, and then you start wondering why you spent so much time, why you committed so much time in the meeting. And so, just restructuring to video meetings, we found like you know the good and bad. A lot of meetings take less time than they used to, but as I think you you sort of indirectly alluded to here, like scheduling meetings gets a little more complex now because there's the, is this going to be a 30 minute video meeting? Does this need to be a 60 minute video meeting? Is this actually weighty enough? We shouldn't do this by video. This should be an in-person meeting. And then is this a one hour in-person meeting or is this like a really big two hour thing that we've got to get them in with? So it, 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 the, it does add a layer of complexity beyond just we do one hour meetings here. Which of the slots would you like? Like, I, I can't do that in this more client responsive meeting approach. Which is another reason for preparation, because if you really map out what needs to be accomplished, you're going to be able to, again, right size the meeting time in advance and set the, set the best expectation for that with them. So even if you have a long-standing meeting and then as you're getting ready, you realize, gosh, we also now, this popped up and this popped up. We scheduled 60. We really need 90. Getting in touch with them in advance saying, you know, in our preparation for our meeting and looking at the agenda, here's what we have. We're going to need more time to make sure that we make, you know, get, get it all, everything through and that you have enough time for your questions and et cetera. And instead of running up to that 60 minutes that they were maybe counting on and then hoping they're still available or rushing through things in the last 10 minutes, trying to get it done in that time frame. So preparation is really the foundation of increasing your probability of success in your meetings, whether it's a sales meeting or a client meeting. It's, it's the foundation. And it, 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 it seems so simple, but there's good preparation and then there's less productive preparation that gets us ready. The difference being? The difference is a lot of people do their preparation thinking about what they want to say. <laughs> and, and they don't do enough preparation thinking about what do they need to learn? What do I need to ask? What's going to make this a good outcome for them as well as me? What's the engagement along the way? So even if I have to explain that to them information, whether it's in the sale and I'm explaining how we're going to work together, what the process looks like, or I'm explaining something specific to the next steps in their plan, planning for how do I make this interactive? How do I make this something we're doing together versus me spewing a lot of information toward them? And and people don't give enough thought to how to make that interactive. You gave an example earlier about something where you, and you said, instead of 
telling them about all of this, I could uh, about the meeting, you know, the coming in, the guy that had to the four meetings, that you could have said, you know, well, you know, how how many times a year do you think it would be necessary or would make you comfortable that we met about your finances? You know, asking, being prepared for those questions versus the talking points. So to me, preparation that's not as effective is a list of your talking points versus a list of the information exchange that needs to happen. It's an interesting way of framing. I, I, I liked the, you know, we spend too much time thinking about what we're going to say and not enough thinking about what we need to learn, mm-hmm. you know, f- from the client, from the prospect mm-hmm. in the meeting. Yeah. That I'm um, like, reflecting back to various meetings I've had with clients and prospects recently. I'm like, I, yeah, I still do a little too much what I'm going to say and not enough what I need to learn. It's easy to get in that trap. So, you know, when people talk to me about they're not converting, you know, they've got a, a low conversion rate or I'm getting in front of these people. Finally, I've done all this work and I'm getting in front of them and then they're not going anywhere. So I haven't heard a no, they're stuck in limbo. You know, so what do I need to do to close better? <laughs> what do I need to close better? And it's like, it's probably not your close. <laughs> it's probably what happened before that, that didn't give you the information that allowed you to make a compelling summary that made it clear that they needed to take the next step to get what they need. So so going back to this conversation framework, okay, so once we're prepared, we need to initiate our conversations. And, and initiate is, again, setting up collaboration, helping them break their preoccupation, and coming to this shared agenda. So like our financial advisor, and he's been doing this, we've worked with him for 20, I'm coming in 26 years now. You know, he'll always say, you know, here's what we have. What's going to make this a good meeting for you? Or what's on your list? And right from the beginning, we're getting to this shared meeting agenda, which gains me permission and that they're going to participate and not sit there and be judge and jury with me sharing information that I think is important, but I don't know if it's important to them. (laughs) So we have to initiate and, and really center so why are we here and why is it important to you? You know, and, and this is where people, when they first practice the initiate, they'll say, well, I wanted us to get together because I wanted to share with you how the process works. And then I'll be able to tell you it's this I, 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 I statements. And we got to really get to the we pretty quickly. So it's, you know, we schedule this time to and then get to that shared agenda. And then it's, and what that's going to mean for you is that by the time you leave today, you're going to have a clear, some, you know, clear plan of your next steps. And, you know, collectively, we're going to agree on the next time we meet. So we, we get that upfront agreement on where this is going, which paves the way for the rest of it to go easier. Yeah, it's agendas. I'll admit it's another one of those things. Like I, I did not do for years. Like could just would go into the client meeting with you know we got our plan. It's the plan presentation meeting. We're going to come in and present the plan, or you know it, it, it's a portfolio review meeting. We'll make sure we have the performance reports prepped, and then we'll go in and review the portfolio, and you know try to always remember to say the client at the end. Like, it, you know, is there anything else that you had questions about today? And like at best, it was a throw in at the end. <laughs> and it was like I never got for me, like I, I never got the importance of like from my end of setting the of trying to send out agendas in advance and do that. Like it's a portfolio review meeting. We're going to talk about the portfolio review. I sent the client a meeting confirmation that says portfolio review. So the client knows it's about a portfolio review. So like I don't really need an agenda. Like we all have kind of said what this meeting is about. And, and the thing that never clicked for me was, you know, sometimes something's gone on in their life and what they actually want to talk about at their upcoming financial advisor meeting has nothing to do with the portfolio review that was scheduled Mm -hmm. or the plan update or the, you know, whatever thing it was that 
we were going to do in our meeting because this is our process. This is the meeting where we do the tax review or the end of year loss harvesting or the like whatever the thing is. And that, you know, once we started reaching out in advance, say just, you know, here's the, you know, here was the agenda and what we were going to talk about. Is there anything you want to add to this from your end that you want to make sure we cover in the meeting? And, you know, every now and then the thing clients would reply with something that's like, oh, that's way important, more important than what we were going to talk about. And you just completely sent the meeting in another direction. Like, that's fine. That's the thing you actually want to talk about. So like, that's what we're going to cover. And knowing it in advance helps you be ready to be valuable during that. Yes, it's a heck of a lot easier than, you know, we, we get like a ways into a meeting doing a portfolio review or something. It's like, well, is, you know, is there anything else you want to talk about for the last 15 or 20 minutes of my meeting? You're like, oh, well, I'm thinking about changing jobs and starting my own firm. Like, oh, that's going to be really hard to cover in the 15 minutes we have <laughs> remaining in this meeting. I wish I'd known about that sooner. Yeah. And just those, those kinds of things, which to me in the past were, were either – Either they would derail the meeting or more often it was like, hey, that's a really important thing. Like, we, you know, let us know all the information that we need to take in and we will schedule another meeting with you next week. And like, we will dive into that further. And and then we would, you know, I mean, we were we still trying to be good service people mm -hmm. with the clients that we're working with. But there were times in retrospect, it's like, I probably didn't need to have the first meeting <laughs> <laughs> to find out at the end of the first meeting that there was something else they really wanted to talk about, which I then turned into a second se follow-up meeting. And we probably did more meetings than we needed to here because we didn't just ask in the first place what they wanted to talk about. And just getting into a habit of a week of a week in advance to say like, hey, you know, we normally got a portfolio review coming up for the next meeting. I also want to check in on what's going on with your will because you said you were going to update that in the last meeting. And is there anything else you wanted to add to the agenda for us to talk about at the meeting next week? And it's pretty amazing how much more productive the meetings got just because mm -hmm. I knew what was on their top mind. of mind mm -hmm. for them on their mind. And, you know, it didn't take long to figure out like whatever they answer to that email, that always goes first on the agenda. <laughs> Your thing goes second. Imagine that. Yes. <laughs> Their thing goes first. At that part, I, I'm, I'm slow on these things, but that part I figured out. <laughs> And it changes the conversations. And and I kind of realized suddenly, like, they, they were tending to be more engaged because we were talking about the thing that was actually on their mind and not the just the routine meeting I wanted to do with with the caveat that, you know, as you've kind of alluded to here, like, you have to schedule more padding for meetings, you have to schedule a little more time, like just, it takes, it takes more time to proactively have good meetings like that, that I think is what I didn't realize of just like, Hey, I got five hours. We can cram five, one hour meetings in there. Boom, 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 boom. Like the, like the other advice we're talking about. And, and this realization that having good meetings takes additional time to make sure it's a good meeting beyond just what you do in the meeting. So one, one tweak to what you just said, Michael, it doesn't take additional time because we have found in some studies we've done in some firms and other companies that the time for preparation saves time later and in, in multiples. Right. Well, I've, if I took the 10 minutes to have the email exchange that he wanted to talk about changing his job, I would have saved the one hour meeting exactly. he had that didn't actually cover it in the first place. Exactly. Okay. It saves yeah. time either in the direct meeting or it saves time in the follow up afterward in multiples. It is not a one to one. So when people say, I don't have the time to prepare, it's not about having the time, it's about making the time. Because when you make the time to prepare, you're going to be more efficient to have more time to prepare for your other things. And, and so we get ourselves in this cycle of scrambling more and then having to do, I call it the chase and follow up. So, so preparation isn't, it isn't extra time. I just, that's just one tweak that I would give to what you're saying. Cause I've, I've seen it over and over again, personally and with all the clients that we work with. So, okay. So now we have a set agenda. We have a willing, you know, we have a, we, we have a willing information exchange that's already started as we start a conversation. And then we want to make sure that we confirm time, right? So we had 90 minutes scheduled 
is, is do you have a hard stop? We want to, it's just respectful to just verify that the time frame still works for them. And it also lets you know where you can flex within the meeting because, you know, somebody, again, the traffic was bad. Now they're concerned that they really need to leave 10 minutes earlier than they thought. And so the whole time they might be rushing things and not settling in to share information because they don't want to, they don't want to be the one that doesn't get out the door on time. Or you find out that someone has flex at the end and that allows you maybe to explore something that was unplanned and yet really important. So you would ask this, because I'll confess I do not routinely do this in, in climbings, consulting meetings. So you would routinely ask just at at the top of the meeting, like, hey, by the way, you know, we had this on the calendar for an hour, whatever it is. Like, does that still work for you? Do you have any time constraints I should be aware of? And just just put it out there as a check-in. Yes. And, and, and here's, it, you know, people are different. We always talk about, in our world, we talk about tribal types, but you could use disc social styles, you know, just there, there's different communication preferences. So you've got some people that they are going to be so focused on the time and trying to drive things because they want to make sure you're not going to take more time than needed. So by, by getting that agreement again up front on time, you remove that distraction for them. Then for the people that are verbose, you know, get, you know, can, can go, you know, take a lot of information or share lots of information, they like stories and all that. You're now giving a parameter to that, that then 45 minutes into a 90 minute meeting, you could say, Hey, Bob and Joanne, we've got 45 minutes left and five agenda items. Can we move on to this next one? You know, you can, you get to use that to manage your meeting because even though you're in a joint conversation and collaboration is king, you are still the leader of keeping that meeting productive and moving toward something. So, yep, upfront agreement on agenda, upfront agreement on the amount of time, even if you've scheduled the time. It's just, a, I think it's a common courtesy. Yeah, I mean, I get it as a common courtesy. Like, I, I'm, I, I wouldn't try to not do it because I don't, I don't want to have that talking point in the conversation. Don't their think about it. Feedback about their time. Yeah, like I just don't think about it. it. It's just, it's a, it's a, it's a presence of mind thing of, of like, okay, here's another thing I got to remember to do when I'm conducting good meetings. That just, I, I mean, I, I think that to me is one of the reasons why. It, it just takes time and experience to get good at this in, in general for, for what we do as advisors, like early on in your career, you know, you're, you're so in your own head of just like, Oh God, they asked me <laughs> like a tax question. I need to make sure I give them the right number and don't tell them the, the wrong IRA contribution limit or, or, you know, a tax rate. They, like just, we get so stuck on, I just want to make sure I don't want to give a, an incorrect factual answer that like gets me sued. It's going to hurt me. Yeah. You don't, <laughs> Like I don't have the presence of mind to think as I answer this question, am I conducting this meeting in an effective manner? Oh, like you, you yeah, that's right. You have to get to a certain level of comfort with the rest of your expertise, I think, to to get to the point where you can have the presence of mind to then focus on am I running a good meeting? Am I having a good conversation here? Is this going the direction that it needs to go? And not just be stuck in the like, oh, they just asked me this, like, oh, what was that rule again? I know I read this and like trying to recall some technical information because that's what happens when you're still in the learning phase. Well, and I agree with that to a degree because I do think early on having a framework to your conversation actually helps you settle in and be more comfortable with the exchange and and most people, if they're enjoying their experience and they, and, and people enjoy an experience that is focused on them much more than if it's focused on you, even if you can't recall that piece of data that's asked for at the time, you can say, let me confirm that so that I get you the right information. And I think for people just starting out that it's okay to let them know you want to be sure to give them the right information and so it's a follow up to them. You know, as as I put it when we go through some training with advisors in our office, like there is a basic level of standard information that clients just kind of expect you to know off the top of your head or or they start questioning you as a professional. But when you get to more complex stuff, which comes up in a lot of meetings, it's okay to say, Hey, I'm you know, 
let me research that and get back to you. I just want to make sure I give you the right information. Like that's, that's an okay answer. you like, I don't, I don't think less of my doctor because they say, Hey, I, I need to research something. I want to make sure these medications don't conflict. And then I'll come back and let you know. I'm, I'm usually thinking like, awesome. You do that. I'd like the medications to not kill yeah. you. Like, <laughs> this is not, this is not negative. This is like, Oh, my professionals being super diligent. So I don't get harmed. I like this. Right. Right. So like you said, oh gosh, that's another thing to remember. So that's why, you know, in our training and as we work with people to put together the process, we, we give these easy to remember frameworks. So in initiating a conversation, it's a three-step start. You need to always greet them. You need to explain why you're connecting, get agreement. And then you need to ask, meaning ask about time and ask about personal connection to see, are they someone that is going to want to spend time relationship building, or are there someone that's going to want to jump right into the agenda? So, you know, the, the three steps start, it's just, okay, that's what I got to do at the ed- beginning of every conversation. There's a framework to it. And it, it doesn't take that much effort once you have that down. And it doesn't take that long. So then, because if you don't start the conversation well, it makes everything harder going forward. And so I always say that, you know, the real purpose of initiating conversation is to earn the right to get into the information exchange because you need people to be giving you information that again is going to let you position not in a negative manipulative way, but in a relevant way, what they need to know to understand what you offer so that you can move forward. And and so you got to earn the right for people to share. So a lot of times, you know, I, I hear advisors, they start right off, well, what kind of assets do you have? Is that really the question most people are would want to answer right from the get-go. Those are data points. I feel like from our end, and this is probably a misconception you'll disabuse us of, but <laughs> I mean, I, I think that I think the mentality from our end, like you contacted me and said, you want to work with me. You want to hire me to give you advice. In order to give advice, I need to understand your situation and the facts. So when you come into the meeting with me, having said you want to hire me for advice, like, yeah, I'm going to ask a lot of information questions. Like, what did you expect? You came into a data gathering meeting for advice. So now you're interrogating them. Right. So you're, you're so, you, but you're interrogating them then <laughs> instead of investigating. So, right. That's what you have to ask data questions because you have to understand their, their situation. But if you would first ask questions around context, it's going to open up and make it more comfortable. They're going to start trusting you. And then the rest of the, the information is going to be easier. Because how many of times do you meet with people where maybe they're not proud? of the data they're going to share with you. And so you're asking them to, you know, kind of, you know, it's kind of, okay, you used a doctor example. So you go into the doctor and they make you take everything off and lay there naked. And then the doctor comes in. No, they make sure that you, you know, you, you understand what's going to happen. The nurse warms you up to here's what's going to happen. They take your blood pressure. They do this, they do that. They give you a gown. You know, the doctor comes in, there's a little small, talk, you know, I mean, think about that. They don't just jump right into a <laughs> physical examination. And so I think that you're right. You guys do need to do an examination of their financial situation. But if you can start with questions and context that helps them be comfortable with the direction it's going. So we need to ask questions around today, tomorrow, risk and reward. We need to find out what's going. So you know what? You 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 sent an inquiry or you gave a call to our office that you you wanted to to work with us or that you wanted to find out about working with us and what that entails. That's fantastic. To help us get to that point, I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions so that I can understand what's going on today, where you want to be, and we can see where our services are going to be most beneficial. So we got to give it a context. And then we need to find out today, tomorrow. And and I think the important thing is people usually get, yeah, you know, what are you doing here? You know, what have you done in the past? Blah, 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 blah. What, what accounts do you have here, there? That's all important information. The information around that, though, is what lets you know their sense of urgency, 
how important it is for them to do something, how committed they are to actually do something. Are they tire kickers? Or are they serious? You get the dynamics of the the couple if there's you know more than one person. And so we have to be an investigator versus an interrogator getting data points. The data we can gather along the way, but we've got to get them explaining where they're coming from. And in that, I think that's really what makes the difference in someone's comfort level and how quickly they're going to trust you. So some people will trust you based on your degrees and designations. Other people want to know who are you about? What are you about? Can you be trusted? I'm going to be talking to you about something that's, you know, hopefully number three or four in my important list, but it's a a pretty important thing in my life, my financial well-being. How open am I going to be with you about my fears around this, my concerns, my hopes, my dreams? That is where those emotions are the motivators that are going to help people decide to do something or not. Because your competition probably isn't your biggest competitor. It's them doing nothing. Yeah, it's as I like to put it, your 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 primary competition is not other advisors, it's apathy. Mm-hmm. It's them just deciding they don't care enough to do to do anything, which again to me was part of what hit home that a big point of selling is like I'm I'm not selling against what the other advisor does. So, you know, here's why our our service is better or our advice is better or our experts are more experty or all the other things that, <laughs> that we might try to do to differentiate from another advisor, my primary competition is apathy and that they just decide to do nothing because life is busy and they're distracted by other things and so forth. And that part of selling, again, is just getting them to the point of making a decision or taking an action to say like, yeah, I'm ready to actually do, do something. something now. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully with us. And, and that's right. And that's usually not based around data. That's based around their fears, concerns, hopes, and dreams. Right. That's that's what's going to make it compelling for them to do something, because anything they do is change. And I can remember I have a, we have uh, some friends, very, very high net worth people. And I, I preach to everyone how they need to work with a financial advisor, <laughs> because we see in our lifetime, my husband and I, in the 26 years, we see how it has helped us be on a path where we didn't stress about our college or you know college funds for our three kids and we go on great vacations every year and we have our second vacation you know we have all those things and other people in our same financial situation don't because they haven't had good guidance along the way or adhere to any plan so anyway i preach about everyone needs one so finally this guy says to me you know, you've got my wife all on the, you know, undies in a bundle that we need to be talking to your guy. I don't want someone telling me how I have to spend or save my money. So what was preventing him from getting really help that they need? Because he had, I mean, his income accelerated very rapidly. They were not in a position to, to manage that well. And so they were making a lot of decisions that that hurt them in the very short term. But because he had this fear of what that was going to mean, someone telling him, he wouldn't even consider that. So when I said to him, they're not going to tell you what to do with your money. You put together a plan of where you want to be and and what works for you and and all that. And he was like, what? And he they did. They ended up working with our advisor for years. And our advisor even helped him negotiate some new terms on something with his career that was a whole nother layer of income that he had never considered. So, he, you know, he, oh, it's the best thing we ever did. Oh my gosh, you know. But, yep. but if he couldn't have ever voiced that to someone that could help them with that. And so if you've got people in front of you that for some reason they've been compelled to, to explore this, their spouse is nagging them or, or, you know, something, then with you, you can't uncover what those potential barriers might be either. And it's, it's, we call it the risk and reward, the risk of them doing nothing and staying on course of what they're doing or the risk of them doing something different. And exploring that. So, you know, if, if you worked with us, what are, you know, what concerns do you have? 
about having, you know, a financial advisor in your world. Find out from them. They'll, and then they'll, they'll start talking themselves in or out of it. But people don't ask those questions because we assume, well, if they don't ask them, if we focus on data and analysis and here's our process, it's a no-brainer that they have to work with us. But we've got to understand what's in the way. Well, it's a powerful question just to ask. Eh? What concerns do you have about working with a financial advisor? Think of more than one situation in retrospect. I probably should have asked that question. And what do you think you would have learned? What would you have learned if you would have asked that? You know, I'm 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 remembering back to a a situation not dissimilar to what what you just said of a prospective couple that we were look, working with, which was just clearly in the meeting. It was one of those like the wife was driving the meeting and the husband was there because she said he had to be. And, you know, we talked to her and we primarily engaged her and, you know, we tried to draw him into the conversation periodically. And he pretty much declined. He spent most of the meeting sitting there with his arms crossed and in, in, not in the good way. And just uh, neither of us, like there were two in the meeting. Like, I don't think either of us just ever, like I said, again, had like the presence of mind just to say, you know, what, what concerns do you have about about working with an advisor? Because I just I like what I like about the question is it's a good way to I, I'm imagining if I had asked that in the meeting, he would have probably piped right up with something. But the struggle we were having was like he clearly wasn't happy to be there. We didn't know how to ask the question or raise the issue without just you know saying like, so it looks like you two are fighting here in our <laughs> office without saying anything. Like, what's the deal? And I guess I know a few advisors that would probably just go out and say that, but I, I, I that's not my style. So like we just we couldn't figure out how to raise the question, and so eventually, like we we finished the meeting, and they left, and they never came back, and they never contacted us. And what uh, a shame! Again, and and we looked at it as like, well, no surprise because they weren't on board because he clearly wasn't on board to be for this planning engagement in the first place. But as you've raised in the conversation here, like. For all I know, his only hang up was he was completely convinced that at the end of this, we were going to tell him how he's allowed to spend his money or not spend his money, which is not our process either, right? It's, it's, we're helping you plan for yours. We're not telling you what to do, but we never gave ourselves the chance to address, even if that was the concern and then relieve him that it's not what we were there to do. Well, and think about it. I, I think I've mentioned a couple of times that you give value throughout the, the process if you were able to let him articulate whatever that was, you might have been able to help the two of them come to some common agreement or understanding. So you're giving value to their relationship by getting things out in the open so that they can be worked with. So risks are one thing. Rewards are the other, though. We don't ask people about the benefits. We just assume that that's going to come out in you know our four meetings a year, and we're going to be looking at your tax planning, and we're going to help you do this and help that. But asking them, you know, what what do you hope to gain by working with a financial advisor? You know, what what what's the what's the the best outcome of this a couple years from now? And then you'll find out, are they going to talk about financial performance? Are they going to talk about less stress? Are they going to talk about less time on their end? Are they going to talk about getting them and their spouse on the same page? And that, you know, it's going to maybe avoid some more internal family conflicts. I mean, you don't know, again, what is going to be the compelling reason, but you can give them the chance to tell you in a very non-salesy way, like, oh, once you tell me this, this is my my setup into my clothes. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, trap you into that. But also the rewards of them doing nothing. So, you know, what's comfortable about the situation that you're in that might prevent you from doing th anything different? Yeah, Dan, Dan Sullivan, a strategic coach, has a, a question like this. I'm, I'm probably going to slightly butcher his exact <laughs> version, but, but something the effect of if we were meeting three years from today, what has to have gone well in our, in working together that you would be happy with how the three years have gone. Mm -hmm. Right. And like it just, it, it asks the client to visualize essentially what is, what is success look like, look like. And, and but that's a great question itself. What does success look like for you? I mean, there's so many different ways because that question is you asked it is great for some people and for some, like, it's so funny because my, my husband is not a dreamer. 
And so whenever, whenever our financial advisor asks us about, you know, our dreams, it's my husband just sits there and stares at him blankly. It is like the funniest thing. He has given us assignments over the years of things we have to do. And John will always come back in not having done those because he, he just thinks it's stupid and he just doesn't get it. And so, it, it, you know, we have to be careful with how we ask for information on whether people can go there or not. So you gave two good examples, though. You know, if we were meeting three years from now, you know, what would what would have made this good for you? Or you could ask someone that's more direct, what does success look like for you in working with us? Yeah, I, you know, I, I started asking a version of it that wa- that now is is, you know, what has to happen over the next year of us working together? for this engagement to feel productive and useful for you. Oh, that's a good one. And that's how I, that's how I ask now, particularly for folks who are going to be working with new or like, there's something that brought them to the table, right? That they're meeting with us and engaging to have this conversation and potentially engage us with advisors is, is just to ask them like what, what has to happen or change over the next year to make this advisor engagement productive and useful for you. That's good. And it elicits interesting answers that, usually have nothing to do with the things that we sell. (laughs) Right. And when you drive your conversation with prospects, and you can do this very much with your clients as well each time, but when you drive it initially with prospects, you actually can show your expertise through the questions you're asking and differentiate yourself more than giving them a pitch or an overview because you can set up your questions. You know what? The next series of questions I'm going to ask you are around this aspect of financial planning because we find that this is often the driver for many people in your situation. You know, so you can work in your expertise through question setups versus reciting things. Or you know, I was I was recently at a conference and I got to hear so and so speak and it was fascinating the new research that's been done around, you know, this new the new tax laws. And so I've got some questions for you to make sure that, you know, we can maximize the benefits or, you know, extract whatever out of it. But you can use those things to set up your questions. So you're educating them about your experience, how you stay current and your knowledge without telling them. And it it changes their acceptance of comfort and their trust in you. So where does the conversation go next in this? So after you understand their story, then you summarize it. Okay, Bob and Joanne. So what we've learned is, you know, here's what's going on now. Here's the the challenges you have, the concerns you have. You know, what's ideal for you is this, this, and this. So do I have that right? And then when they're like, yeah, do you want to hear how our services then are going to help you get there? And then now you've got permission to now explain what you do. But this is where that right-sizing is so important. Focusing on the aspects that are most important to what you just heard. So even if you have a 16-point process, you can show a visual or, or show that, but you focus on Here's what's most important. So, you know, you mentioned that taxes are so important to you. We do this whole, you know, and here's what we do surrounding that. And then you can give an example. You know, so when we were working with so-and-so, you know, names withheld, you know, one of the things that we found was that blah, 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 blah. So you can work in your validation and your proof that you know what you're talking about with that. But you focus on the three, four, maybe five key things that draw out. And so how you do it, isn't usually as important as as the outcomes that you're providing in your process. Now, once you get, of course, to their signing on, you do need to set expectations on what does the implementation look like. So, you know, we're going to ask you for this and that. But that, no one's going to decide to buy your services based on your intake process or onboarding of new clients. Unless I'm wrong. No, and I, maybe <laughs> if that's like really their hot button because it was really painful last time and took a lot of time. Unpleasant. But. Right. Right. But you'll know that because you would have asked them about their past experiences. So you'll know that they were frustrated with whoever they were working and, with. And at some point, you probably have to add more value beyond your onboarding process or they're not going to stay. But yeah. Exactly. 
that's not what your sale is going to be. So anyway, so so that's the, that's what's next. So we and we call it the what's to whip it. Explain what you need them to know, but then immediately connected. And so what that means for you, or as you were telling us, you know, this is why this is important. But we always have to connect it back to them. So four meetings a year. Right? I just I love using that example. Four meetings a year. You know. Why the four meetings a year are important to you is based on your cash flow and how your bonuses are paid out at work. That's going to allow us every quarter to recalibrate, you know, and be able to whatever. So I got to tie it into them on why it's important. And we can do those virtually because, you know, traffic in here is is, is hard for you. And that was, you know, something that was an important part. You know, so you can, you just have to connect it. And that's where you, by right-sizing, making pre- present, helps them see, now I see what's valuable to me. And then, of course, what's key is after each point or every two points, you say, how does that sound to you? How does that compare to what you were doing before? How do you see this going to help you get where you want to be? How do you see this going to minimize the time? You said, you know, you're spending too much time working on this. How much time do you think you would save if we were doing this part of it? So you're letting them talk value along the way. And, and, and if you're hearing them not talk value, <laughs> you know that that's not important or that's something that they're not agreeing with and you can adjust. But if you give them your whole spiel and then say, how does that sound to you? Or what questions do you have? Or do you, un- this is my favorite. So does that make sense to you? That is a really challenging question because if someone says no, in some ways they might have to feel that they're admitting ignorance. So instead is, you know, have I explained that, you know, to the level that you need, you know, you take ownership for something if they didn't understand it, but we want to engage them still along that way. And then through that exchange, we want to also find out about their concerns, you know, about, well, in the process that we have, what would be, you know, is there anything in there that is of concern to you or that you're, you're questioning or that you're, you're wondering how that really works out, but you're giving them a chance to let you know, because when they tell you, then you can work through it. And then it, the close becomes so easy. So based on everything we talked about, you know, you, you, and then you tie in what they were telling you about value. The next logical step would be this. And it's easy. Like and that's what people say is it's so easy to close when you've done the other things productively. Yeah, it's the thing that strikes me is just the level of asking questions along the way of just breaking your, you know, here's, you know, here's what you've told me about your situation, my understanding, you know, say what you've learned. Do I have that right? You know, here's a piece of what we do. You know, you're, you're very concerned about estimated taxes because you got stung on it last year. So, you know, we do four meetings a year so we can line them up for your estimated tax payments to make sure we're always checking in and, and that you've got your payments right. How does that sound to you? And and just asking those questions and taking those pauses. Power in the pause, Michael. Power is in the pause. <laughs> the piece that I think took me a while just to get used to in the sales process is that, you know, like I've, as you said, like, I've got my 16 step process or, you know, our, here's, here's the 12 things that we do great at our firm that we're going to do for you. And you're going to love it. And you know, we've got all this value. Let me show you how much value we put on top of the value to justify our fees. And that often it's only one or two things that are really what drives the sale for a particular client. Like it's whatever their hot button issue is. Yeah, yeah, you got to check the box and some other things. But often there's only one or two hot button issues that really drives the the decision. And if you can just clearly address those, you're all like, you're already done. They're already saying yes. And it took me a long time to not want to then still talk about the other 11 things that we <laughs> talked about yet. Because I'm like, you're saying yes already, but wait, there's more. And like, just couldn't, <laughs> couldn't help myself. Cause you know, we're, we get really proud with what we do and what we offer. It was hard to stop, you know, the, the, 
label that one of our founding partners kindly gave me frequently was like, you already closed. Stop talking past the sale. Stop overselling. Yeah. Right. Cause yeah. like, I just, I would, I would just keep going. And, and then it was even harder, at least for me to really accept like, yeah, there were 12 awesome things that we want to talk about. We do, but they really just bought us for one and, and that's okay. Mm-hmm. And the others can be pleasant surprises later. Yes. And we'll, we'll do our- <laughs> to, to keep them loyal and giving referrals and, you know, renewing yeah. every, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But just that whole idea of like, I felt like I had to show all 12 things to make it add up to what they want to buy. And where did that center maybe in your belief in what the value really was? Yeah. Or I think particularly early on, like, frankly, it was probably more like my insecurity that I was worth the fees that I was charging. Right, so yeah. I had to like, I now looking back on it, I call it the value barf. Like I would just keep barfing up more value. Like, and we do this and we do this and we did like just trying to stack the layers to make sure that it added up to enough value that would get them to say yes. Not even recognizing that sometimes they were already sold on the first one or two items. We didn't, we didn't need the rest. And, and that not only did they not need it and not necessarily want it, it was not at all constructive to say like, but wait, let me just talk about them for a few minutes. Like, because mm-hmm. at that, that point, that was entirely about me and not about them. Like, I was just really proud and want to talk about the stuff. Like, I didn't think <laughs> of it that way at the time. But looking back, like, that's clearly what was what was happening. Just that that whole phenomenon of sometimes it takes far less than we think it does to get someone on board as a client. If you just answer and address the one or two things that's really bothering them and pressing on them. Yep. And then going back to something we said toward the beginning, then they're not saying what well, I don't need those things. So I want to adjust the fees. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, for me, the the first change I made just realizing that was, you know, you talk about setting the meeting up well, and I don't know, maybe you can tell me there's a better way to do this. But I, I just got in the habit of starting every meeting with the new prospect of just saying, you just so what what brings you to our office today? You know, particularly because we tend to work with a lot of retirees or near retirees. So you know you you've been doing the you you've been managing your own finances for twenty or thirty or forty years. One day out of a clear blue sky, you contacted us and showed up in our office. So what's going on that you're actually here today? And that is a great initial question because based on their answer then you know where to go Yep. and see, and that wasn't a data point. Yeah. I would ask what and why. Yeah. And just let them answer. It's like, okay, this will be the dominant theme for all of our conversation. Whatever, whatever right. thing you just, whatever thing you just answer to that. If I can solve that, this is probably going to go very well. And, you know, and wait until you see the other 11 things we've got to. <laughs> Pleasant surprises. Like I said, ple- I mean, it's always, I love it when people will say afterward, you delivered what I hoped or expected and so much more. Like that is a good place to be. So you know, the challenge to me in, in advisor world today is that no one teaches us this stuff. You know, there was a there was an age in the industry where sales training was pretty standard. Everybody come in and got sales training. It was generally done by the large firms. Because that, that was where most advisors were, and you know they would hire people in, and they would put you through a sales training process. You know they usually marketed it as advisor training, and then it turned out it was sales training. But it was still really good to learn sales training because whether you're selling a product or your advice or yourself, like at some point you have to convince people to make a decision or take an action. And you know these days, as we said at the beginning, sales seems to have become such a stigma that you know, quote, no one wants a sales job anymore, right? I, I came here to be an advisor, not not sell. Well, you got to sell yourself if you're going to be an advisor. But then the the world of sales training is not what it was before. A lot of the firms just don't do it anymore because they basically figure out they train people and then the people leave. Or the sales training is still mired in our roots, which is, you know, producty sales training and not 
not what we're talking about here, which is really just like you're having a conversation with the client about the stuff that they care about and then showing how your stuff solves their stuff. Like That is such a very succinct way of saying that, Michael. <laughs> yeah, like, it's, not, it's not rocket science. Just <laughs> ask them what they want and then give them that. Yeah. Um, don't overcomplicate the rest of it with, with the caveat that like figuring out how to have those conversations well and just – at least for me, my hang up for the long time was just figuring out like, what are the right questions to ask? And literally, how do you ask them and not sound awkward in the meeting? Like for me, it took a long time to find the words. And I still feel like I'm constantly in a quest to find better words to ask some of these questions and start some of these conversations. So I know like you have tools and system that you built around this. So can you tell us a little bit about like what... What do you actually do? We spent a while now talking all about sales and having better conversations and stuff. But like, what do you actually do in this world of trying to teach it? Well, we we help we, you know through training and helping people put together their their process. But we help people learn this framework, but then take each piece and make it their own. So we don't we don't give people scripts. Instead, we introduce them to, you know, here's how you initiate a conversation. Here's the framework, the three step start. Now let's work on how that sounds for you. So we call it genuine sales, our course, because it's let's take the best practices and best processes, but then they've got to be yours because you're in most cases selling yourself. So if you are are, you know, not comfortable in the words you're using, or it's not relevant in the work that you're doing or how you explain things, it's not going to be real. So, so in our training, we do what we call the immersion. And when we do it virtually for small teams, we have a group of people come in over, and this was something Alan Moore challenged us to make sure we could do it and eliminate the travel. But over four initial sessions, we, we help them learn the, pro, the, the system, the system of a conversation, because systems have predictable outcomes and steps and stages and all that. And then we have accountability over the next seven, eight weeks to focus and use the information. So it's all about, it's not more knowledge, it's about actionable tools and processes because if you're not using it, you're never going to get better at it. So then there's the accountability each week to have to focus on a different part. And then with your group, we practice different pieces, find out what worked, what didn't. And so like, let's talk about questions. We, in the 26 hours over these 10 weeks, we probably spend four to five hours just working on the questions and then practicing them and tweaking them. And, and, you know, learning from each other and, and creating resources so that it's easy to, okay, I need to ask questions around this. Here's my, my, my cheat sheet. I've got 20 questions. Which of these four best fit this situation so I can make that easy? So it's all about best practices and then working through activities to make them your own and make it comfortable to use it. So over the 10 weeks, we just watch people's confidence soar. We watch their skill level soar because typically if they're having regular conversations, meaning, you know, I mean, most people should be having multiple, if it's not a prospect meeting, it should be a center of, of influence meeting or a networking session. They should be having conversations with potential business providers, whether it's prospects or someone else every week. And so we typically see that by two or three weeks, they're already seeing that they've had success because, oh my gosh, look at if I stop my normal of throwing up on them, you know, as soon as I get a chance and I get to tell someone what I do and their eyes glaze over and they're just trying to run away from me. But instead I lead with questions and by learning that information, I earn the right to position what I can do and lead them through getting a decision they just become more confident in building those skill sets. And so we have, I think we're at like 99.4% of people by the end of the 10 weeks have already returned their financial investment because of, of extra sales. And then, I mean, you've heard on some of the other podcasts. Well, in our, in our business, like, you know, uh, clients are still really valuable. Like it, it, it only takes a client or two to make 
most investments and in, in ourselves pay off very quickly when you know, many clients pay thousands of dollars. Some of them pay thousands of dollars annually recurring with really high retention rates. Absolutely. So it's so wonderful to, to give people something very practical and actionable that has a very quick return on them because selling isn't what most of you guys aspire to do or really want to do. So if you can do that well and efficiently, it gives you more time to focus on the things you like to do. And what is the what is the program cost for people that are interested in going through a training like this? It's $3,500 for a 10-week program. So most people, like I said, one or two new clients and they've returned that and then they accelerate. And you know this, if you've seen it on some of the XYPN podcasts, you know, we have some great success stories of, of you know, the Kyle Moore who sold $220,000 in his first few months because he just needed this process to his conversations to stop burning through his leads. What is there a a common like biggest mistake you typically see that advisors make or 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 do like are cuz I know you you do this for a couple of industries like are, are there particular common patterns or blocking points in our advisor world? Yes. And so we'll get over the fact about the lead gen things and people not spending their time in the right ways there and talk about the actual once they have someone the biggest thing is this talking at them and telling people what they do, trying to convince them that they need a financial planner. It's, it's, I see it all the time. And when I talk, I do strategy conversations. I, they're like, well, this is what my first meeting looks like. I have my overview. I tell them everything I do. And then I ask them, you know, if, if they want to sign up for the service. And I, I'm like, oh my goodness, no wonder no one's going with you. You're not, you're not making it about them. They're not seeing value for them. You're just talking at them. I think that is the biggest. Well, I, I, I know I was guilty of this early on. Like just, you know, I learned all this stuff. I know this stuff. I should just be able to show you that I know all this stuff. And then you should want to sign up. Like I, I, it's how I want it to work. Right. I just, I want you to tell, I want to tell you about the stuff that we do and then you'll want to sign up. So I just need to tell more people what I do and then you'll, more people will sign up. So I was talking with a man last week and he said, you know, and I'm try my 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 stupid family and friends like I keep telling them how they need a financial plan and all the reasons why and they're just, you know, ignoring me. And I just said, have you do they even know what a financial planner does? Because, you know, like you're 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 telling them they need something that they don't even know what it means, let alone what it means for them. And they haven't really given you permission to pitch at them about it. So, of course, they don't want to hear you. And then we say, and the people closest to you, in this case, this guy was a career changer. I go, they know you as someone that's done this. And now over the last year, you've taken classes. And they're thinking, why would I listen to him about finances? He doesn't know anything. I remember 12 months ago when he didn't know anything about this. Like, yes. how much can he yeah. learn about my life savings and how to handle it in a 12-month <laughs> class when I knew him as an engineer for the past 17 years? Yep. So we Right. So we talked about what are the three or four questions that you could use to start that conversation to find out what they maybe know about financial planning, whether they've ever, you know, they've got anything that they've ever considered talking with somebody about. And maybe there's something that you could quickly help them with to show you've got some value there. And then say, you know, why don't we sit down? Because grabbing them at the family birthday party you know, isn't really a way to, to get that done. So that's, that's the number one thing I see. So my second one is the in interrogation, is digging in for all these data points instead of, instead of getting context to that person's financial world where the data points make sense. Because somebody with $5 million in assets, is that because they inherited it? You know, is that because, and, and, they, and it was a sudden thing, they've never managed it? Is it because they've been, you know, scrapping and working their butts off, you know, since they were in high school? And so there's a different emotional attachment to it. You know, it, you don't know. So that's the, that's the second big thing. And then, oh, I mean, but then there's the third that I think is really important. 
they don't ask for people to make the to take the next step. So that's the big thing. They don't they don't clearly lay it out of what needs to happen. So somebody says, well, let us think about it, or they actually give them permission. You know, so now what I'll do is I'll put together a specific recommendation and an initial starter plan for you, and I'll send it to you, and then I'll follow up with you sometime next week, and we'll see where we go from here. And that is, I always say, what you've done is take all the responsibility and you've let them off the hook. Not again, not nailing them on the hook, you know, in a manipulative way. But now what you've done is you haven't scheduled anything. You've just committed to do how much work. And they you don't have any commitment that they're in it with you. So and some people don't even need a proposal, you know, to, to, to take the next step. Do you want, you know, to schedule a planning meeting? But but if they ask you to put something together that's when you need to say, you know, I'd be happy to do that. Let's schedule time for them to us to then re- review that information because then we can walk through it together and I can answer questions real time. And if someone is elusive at that point and they won't commit to anything, they just say, oh, send it to me and then I'll let you know what questions I have. What do you think happens, Michael? Yeah. So, so how should I be asking this question towards the end of my meeting to set it up? You should say, you know, I'd be happy to put that information together with you, just like I said. And well, but I mean, if they haven't asked for information, like just you know, I spent I spent the last hour hopefully investigating and not interrogating you about all your issues and your problems. And I know I've got cool stuff, and I hopefully did a good job of linking my cool stuff to your problems and concerns. And now we're getting to the moment at the end of the meeting where like the close action has to happen. So like. If I'm not supposed to say, hey, why don't you take this stuff home and think about it and I'll check in with you next week, like, how am I supposed to ask that? <laughs> so it's called, we call it the three step finish. <laughs> we have the three step start. It's a three step finish. So the first thing I want to do is say, I want to, I want to check for their readiness. And so I'm going to say, you know, based on all of these things that we talked about today, you know, how, how does, how does this sound to you? You know, the, the, the plan that we would take in working together. Or, you know, we can do one last check in whether they have any concerns. And often those opinion questions, they didn't ask them to make a decision. They didn't say, do you want to work with me? I'm asking them how they feel about it, how they think about it, whatever. Often that will lead them to say, I think we we want to get started. We don't even have to often ask that commitment or decision. If they don't, though, but we know that from their opinions, they're positive about it, then that's when we confirm value one last time. Well, you know what, Bob and Joanne, I'm confident that in working together a year from now, you're going to be in a much better position and you're going to have spent less time personally on this that you said was so important to you. Should we initiate an agreement or whatever your next action is? Should we initiate agreement? Do you want to schedule the, the implementation meeting, which is the first step in the process? But we've got to be specific on what we're asking them to do. That's it. It's it's sim- it's really that simple. Because all you're doing, we call it consolidating versus closing. Consolidating means bringing together. What you're doing is just bringing together that whole conversation you've had and laying out the clear, easy next step for them to make a decision on. So, what are you what are you building towards? Like, what's next for you, having created this system and and now making available to advisors as a as a program and you've written your book on it and and for folks that are listening we'll make sure we have links out to to Nancy's book and the genuine sales training and the rest if you're interested so this is episode 88 so you can go to kitsis.com/88 to find the links in the resources area but Nancy for you like what what are you building where are we going towards? yeah like where are you going with with this whole system and structure and book and everything that you've created yeah so you know, I have been helping companies strengthen their sales for almost 20 years. A few more months, it's 20 years. And I've always worked in financial services because I was in banking for five years myself before that. And and so we've always had that as part. In these last three years, we've seen such a need for the smaller companies to get the resources and the tools and the methodologies that typically aren't available to them. 
So not necessarily just financial services, just small business across the across the world. Professional services, so there's a specific focus. There's a lot, you know, t- nowadays there's a ton of marketers and financial advisors and accountants, CPAs, and that that have technical expertise, but then don't know how to build their sales function. So knowing how to sell is one thing, and we've got great training for that. But one of the gaps that we've identified is people also don't have defined their sales process. So there's the conversation part of sales, but what's the process from the time I get a lead to onboarding them? What's the process? So that is coming out very soon. So the additional resources to help the, the small businesses get the work we do for companies, which is very holistic. We help them hire the right people, you know, assess them. We put together their whole training plans and process plans. We we're, It's very comprehensive for the companies, but small businesses don't have the $75,000 to $100,000 to invest in that. So we have worked really hard the last couple of years on how do we allow this help that they need to be affordable and accessible. And, and that's what we're doing. So we'll be, we'll be launching the Genuine Sales Growth System, which includes the, the putting together your process, helping you become skillful in the, in the conversion you know, conversations, and then having the accountability for the add-on you know, afterward. And, and that's, that's, what, that's what's next for us. Bringing the what corp big corporations get to the people that need it most because I do understand that for a lot of people in their small firms and in their growing firms that if they don't figure out this part of of running their business and if they don't put as much effort into a sales function and process as they do into their you know planning tool or you know setting up their payment system they're they're going to struggle unneedlessly. Or not only needlessly, they're going to struggle. So, so for advisors who are interested in listening, like genuine sales is the 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 conversation, like learning to do the conversation self in in that meeting with that client, and maybe the the preparation leading up to it to make sure that that meeting ends ends favorably. The growth system that you're building is the rest of the the system and process that leads up to that about. How do you actually build up to getting more meetings with prospects? You can then do this good sales system to close. Right. But not, we know we don't focus on the marketing aspects. It's, you know, once you have someone's name, what is your process? You know, what are the resources you need? How do you start nurturing someone before they're ready to raise their hand and schedule an appointment? And so it, it's working through defining that, that workflow process for your, for your practice. So as we wrap up, this is a, a podcast about success. And, and one of the things we always observe is just even the word success means different things to different people. So you, you, you've built this successful system. Advisors are using it. Other industries are using it. You build a successful business doing this training and, and systems development for others. But I'm, I'm curious just for yourself personally – how do you define success for yourself? By the number of people I help succeed each year. It, it's, it's in working with my business coach this last couple of years, he said, you really are not driven by the dollars at the end of the year. They're there. I said, no, I'm driven by the number of people we've helped that year. I love it. And so, you know, we can work with big companies and work with 100 people on their sales team. And we've done that around the world. And I don't, I, I, I love it. We know we, we help them, but it's not personally as satisfying to me as helping the small businesses because there's, a, there's something different at stake there. Well, I hope we inspire a few more people to succeed in the coming year and themselves to your list of, of people you've helped with the discussion here. You know, again, I, I feel like we've, we've gone so far, like the pendulum has sunk so far in the industry from having our roots and selling products. And that was how we were getting paid to this other end of the spectrum where we get paid for our advice and our product, not our products and gone so far away that now we don't even want to talk about sales and selling, even though we still need it, that I know it's become a blocking point for a lot of advisors. And so hopefully the discussion here inspires a few to I get the book or, or go through the program and, and learn how to do this better. 
start a conversation with me, right? I, th- there'll be a link in there for them to schedule a conversation where we, we call it a strategy conversation. But we just finished up with a group of financial advisors and and several of them at, at the end of their celebration, you know, said, and what I've realized, and I think this summarizes it is, sales is not a dirty word. <laughs> I thought that's a great way of of ending it. Sales is not a dirty word. And we can do it in a very collaborative and comfortable way that doesn't compromise our ethics and who we are as a person. And I I think that that's what's so rewarding is when I discovered that 23 years ago, it was a, it was, it was a really a life changer. It was a career changer and a life changer for me. And so it's, it's just so rewarding to help other people get there and then get the tools to do it well. And, you know, if you're an advisor that's listening and you just don't feel like you're that comfortable with what you have to sell in the first place, you know, recognize from the industry's perspective, the other dynamic is maybe you need to be at a different place where you can actually sell something you're proud of selling. Because I know that's mm-hmm. still a blocking point for for some advisors as well. It's amazing I mean, that was certainly the biggest shift for me. It's 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 amazing how easy, it's easier it is to do this when you're genuinely proud of what you do and the and the value mm. you deliver. That's so true. Well, thank you, Nancy, for joining us and and talking about why sales is not actually a dirty word on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com. <laughs>